In this week's session, we delved into genome sequencing, all the different generations, and talked about that. We talked about uh, very briefly, I, I mentioned that NCBI, of course, as always in this field, has lots of uh, resources for genomics. There's a number of really nice databases there at NCBI. Actually, more popular in this field for researchers is uh, just up the road from us, up at UCSC, at our sister institute, University of California, Santa Cruz. They have some fantastic resources for genomics, including a very popular genome browser that we'll use at, towards the end of today's uh, hands-on session. And then also over in Europe, uh, we have the European Bioinformatics Institute um, um, uh, Ensemble. This is, uh, again, a really popular, heavily used, heavily exploited, uh, phenomenal resource for uh, genome informatics in this field. So um, we'll, we'll actually start in a moment into using Ensemble and we'll explore some of the data that's there in Ensemble to help us answer some questions. In our hands-on sheet, we'll actually take a little detour to Omen to look up some disease-associated variants that we'll then explore through Ensemble. And so let's let's just get started. Now I'll I'll mention that um, here that our uh, that our hands-on sheet, you know, the guide for this session, is back to being a PDF format document rather than HTML. I had some uh, comments people liked the PDF. So here, uh, you know, popular demand, the PDF is back. So this is a, a um, again, it's got those wet red question blocks where I expect you to. Uh, where, where you know the purpose of these questions is to guide your exploration of these resources and the tools that we're using and I want you to try and think about these questions that we're posting and answer in those blocks. Now before I forget please download this PDF to your computer and fill it in. These boxes you can click in it's a form right so you, you can add text to these boxes and then save it and we're going to upload it when we're done when you're happy with it to Gradescope to get the credit for this this lab session. So I'll do that in a second, but we'll see here in question one, in this handout, it says identifying genetic variants of interest. So I'll, I'll, you know, you can read it here in the screen behind you. I'll give you a moment to download the PDF if you haven't already got it, and I'll, I'll do it too. But the idea here is we're gonna to go to that database that we talked about before called OMEN. So that stands for Online Mendel Inheritance in Man. Okay, it's kind of unfortunately named as we've discussed um, but it's kind of factored into back when this was an encyclopedia, you know, big collection of thick books that went around to clinicians and folks interested in human uh, genetics and the genetic diseases. And now, of course, it's a database there at that, at that web resource. So we're going to go and use that to go and explore something about uh, asthma, childhood asthma. And in particular, a paper that I found that I really like that we're going to go and uh, ex explore that, that data. Now, the idea here is, if you're interested in some other disease, some other genetic condition that affects humans, for example, just substitute that in for childhood asthma here. And you could follow the same sort of procedure to start investigating the genetic basis of these, of these diseases and the effects on, for example, expression of, of certain key genes involved in these conditions. So we're gonna do that with childhood asthma today. And I'm going to pop over to the R class website. So this is our, uh, uh, this is not our class website, this is our Piazza form, but here's our class website underneath. So we're on week eight, of course, genome informatics. This is our lab hands-on sheet as PDF. I'm going to click that. On my browser, this opens in the browser. So don't do this. Don't fill it in in the browser. You know, hello world. Here you can type in it. Don't do this because it'll be hard to save it. So what I want you to do instead here is actually, when you're on that website, just click to download it, right? or save as, so download linked file. Download it to your computer and open it. Okay, open it in a PDF a reader like Acrobat or Preview if you're on a Mac. Uh, and So then you can fill it in and you'll have a record of your answers. This will be useful for you. I actually have already done that. I've downloaded it and have it open here. So I'm gonna uh, go and flip over to that PDF here. So here it is. And I'm showing question one. So the idea here is now I can type type my answers and I can see if, well, I can also spell correctly if I'm not looking in multiple places at the same time, sometimes. Okay, so I can then save this 
document file, save, um, then you can post that to wherever you want to go. So that's obviously not my answer to the first question. Let's go and uh, do it. Let's go and find out the answer to this question. So here's the link to omin, omim.org. So I'm going to pop over, I'm going to click this, and then we'll pop over back to our web uh, browser here. So here we are back in the web browser. And I'm going to, excuse me, look, so that's, we don't need that anymore. And we have then got Omen open in this tab. So this is the landing page for Omen. And it tells you there might be a, a if you haven't, if you don't regularly visit this page like I do, there might be a first kind of splash page saying, you know, COVID-19 is a emerging threat. Uh, etc etc or please donate to our resources you click that off if you're so motivated to so we can get to the actual search box here underneath and then we could type in asthma and we could search this database for all the studies and all the, the documented uh, records here in this database about asthma i'm going to be a little bit more um, more targeted in this search because i know the paper that I actually am interested in finding it, that information from. Um, I'm going to type the author of that, the first author. So that was Verlan, V-E-R-L-A-A-N. And I might also type uh, asthma, A-S-T-H-M-A. So I'm going to type Verlan asthma here. So that's the, the last name, or the, you know, the family name of the first author of that paper, and then the subject of the paper. And I push return here. And off it goes. It, it finds all these records about asthma, susceptibility to asthma, asthma-related traits. I'm going to pick the first one here. And that brings me to an omen entry for, it says here, asthma-related traits and susceptibility to. Um, it's got uh, various information about asthma-related traits include um, coughing, wheezing, um, bronchial hypertension, all these sorts of hyper-responsiveness, so, so the immune kind of swelling reactions. So we could read all about these things, and then just like an encyclopedia, it has documented different studies and mentions different things that people have found. Like here, this study finds a gene called ORMLDL3 in this particular case, right? that they're finding evidence that's associated with uh, childhood asthma in this case. So I'm going to, you know, we could scroll on through this and eventually we might find a record to the Virlin paper. Actually, I see it coming up here in this paragraph here. I can see Virlin performed functional assays of candidate disease linked variants on chromosome 17. And we could read about the study just like you would in an encyclopedia like entry, which of course Omen is. If you didn't find this by scrolling down, feel free to use the, you know, the find in page option of your web browser so you know you can do the i um, mine i would do command f or control f it brings up this this little find in page and then we could type virlin in here and push turn on it'll bring you to that entry it says it's mentioned three times on this page and here it is okay so here's the the information about the virlin study so i'm going to uh focus in on this for a second here it says these genes, Z, P, B, P2, G, S, D, M, B, really catchy names, right? And O, R, M, D, L, 3, again, that was mentioned in some other studies, have been uh, linked in this virulent paper. And it says associated studies of four candidate SNPs. So these single nucleotide polymorphisms were found in this genome-wide association study here. So and there's a, uh, what's called an RS number here. The one, two, three, four SNPs. And if we remember that first question back on our PDF, if we, if we go to it here, I'll actually go and show you that. It asked us, what are the four SNPs from this Fairland paper? So that's them, right? It's this RS129. Let's go back to the, the web page and we see them. It's these things. It's the... It's the... RS numbers is what we're looking for. So these are actually links, as you as you can see, right? They're, they're the blue font here. So let's click on some of these to find out more about them. But this is the answer to question one, essentially. These are the SNPs that we're interested in, in this case.
So I'm going to click here. I actually have it open in a tab already, but I, I could click this to, this one to open up the link for this snip. This will take me to Ensemble. This is the EBI uh, resource here that we mentioned a moment ago. So I'm going to click off the, the, the little banner at the top that told me I've been redirected, not from their European site, but to their US Mira because I'm sitting here in the United States. So it takes me to my the closest um, version of this. And here it's there's the RS number for this first snip, RS12936231. Okay, you don't need to remember it. We'll write it down. We'll add it to our add it to our PDF document. In fact, let me do that now so I don't uh, forget about it. Here, so here's my PDF, and I'll go and go and add that. So I'll paste that in. Oh, that's not the one. I'll make sure that I have it on the clipboard. And well, I will write it out. I paste it. So R R S one two nine three six two three one. Better to paste it than you not make a mistake. So that's the first one. Let's have a let's go back and have a look at that. What ensemble tells us about this snip. So we'll we'll go back to that that web site that we just visited. The web link. So here it is. It tells us that this is an intron variant. So it's in the intronic region, not in an exon of a gene. And it tells me that the alleles that, that they've seen is a C, a G, or a T. And the minor allele frequency, this MAF, is 0 0.43, and that's a G. So that's if you mouse over it, it'll tell you something about what these things mean. So the minor allele frequency is the frequency of the second most frequent allele in this large-scale sequencing project called the Thousand Genomes Project that we'll take some data from in a moment or two. Uh, so the first one to see, this is on the forward strand here, and then we also see a G, and we also sometimes see a T allele here. Uh, now, it's, this is an intron, so it lies within a gene, but it doesn't affect the exon region. If we want to know, and this is actually the um, the next question in our uh, hands-on session, right? Question two would be uh, what variants or what genes do these variants affect? So let's go and have a look. So here it says this variant overlaps four transcripts. You see about this variant down here. And then some regulatory features, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm going to click on this four transcripts to see what the transcripts are. So it opens this little table below here, and it's got the ensemble gene ID. This is not very helpful at this stage because I don't know what ENSG 00011806, I don't know this code. It's only of relevance to the database. But it's got the Human Genome Nomenclature Commission name for the gene. It's a little small here. Let me zoom in. But this is what I'm looking for. It's ZPB. P2. That's the gene name, and I could go look that up in in uh, NCBI gene or, or, or anywhere else. I'll see that this allele is a G. There's also T's in, in, in other regions. So these are different um, variants of this gene here in this case. So this is an intron variant. So that's what I want. So I would do that for the different SNPs, and we'll see that some of them actually don't lie in genes, but they're close to certain genes, and we'd want to know uh, what those genes are. So this one, it's in the intron, and that's that's fine. We've learned about that. So let's go and zoom back out. Here, I'm going to go back to Omen for a minute. So here's my all four SNPs. Let me make sure I get a good record of all those. And then I'm going to go put those in my PDF, so I make sure that I have my um, so I make sure I keep a record of my answers as I go through. So here I am back here, and let's see if my copy paste will work now. Nope. Okay, we'll figure that out after. So we've got our, our different snips that we can add here. I'm gonna go and actually go and explore some of the other ones while I fix my pasteboard. 
here. So let's back, go back to the website. And let's pick the second one, this RS80806. So I'm going to click this one. And that'll open up again the ensemble page for this variant, the SNP. So this is a regulatory region variant, so it affects the regulatory region of a particular gene. It's an A here uh, on the forward strand, that's the reference, the alternative allele is the G, that's the minor allele, and it's got a frequency kind of similar to the last one, 0 0.43 here. And we see that it, it doesn't overlap with genes. So down here about this variant, it doesn't tell me that it's in a, in a gene itself, but it affects a regularity feature. We could click on this to find out uh, more about it. Here, the, the kind of thing that we're gonna need to do is, um, you know, and, and, and question, a three actually in our hands on it, it's going to say, you know, the location of a particular SNP, for example, this one, uh, what are the different alleles for it? Okay, so the different alleles for this RS80, 8062737, 8, is A and G. I would just take this, a little bit of information here. These are the different uh, alleles, A to G, and the ancestral is G and the minor allele frequency is G. So I would take this, copy it in, and that would be my answer to uh, question three if we go back to the PDF. Sorry for keeping, uh, jumping between these screens and making you dizzy here, but here's uh, what genes do these overlap. We would have our ZPB2 and any others of the different alleles. Here it's asking me in question three, what's the location of the RS806738? We don't, haven't found out the location yet, but the uh, the allele frequency, that would be the one that we just found. The location, how we find the location, if we go back, it's listed on the, on the web page on Ensemble there. It's, and I've zoomed in a little bit, but this location here is chromosome 17. And then the coordinates on this forward strand are three, nine, eight, nine, five, zero, nine, five. So again, copy and paste that in. Uh, that would be your answer to the location. You'll also see, if I zoom back out for a second on this page, it's got a location tab right here. It's kind of the web design is a little funky. Sometimes students miss this tab. If you can see where my mouse is here, I'm actually pointing up to the top corner there, right underneath where it says human, and as the picture of David, it's got two tabs. These are meant to be different tabs. It's not always clear that they are two tabs, but I'm on this one, all about the variant at the minute. If I click on this one, I'll get to a genome browser, the ensemble uh, browser view here that'll be focused in on this location, on chromosome 17. That's where this SNP is located in this region. So let me click on that and show you what this looks like. It might take a second uh, to load up. And here, what I've got behind me now, or on my by screen in front of me, is the, the browser here. So it's focused on chromosome 17. And we start at the top. We've got this track. Um, and you know, UCC is somewhat similar to this. And other genome browsers you'll come across, they have this idea where they'll have what we call tracks, so different layers of information. So there's a there's a layer up at the top, and then there's some other information below, and then we scroll down. There's more information, all kind of in different layers as we as we dig deeper into information about this region of the genome. So here we've got this is meant to be a, a little picture of the chromosome with its kind of banding, you know, the dye pattern. That's why they're called chromosomes initially because they soaked up dye like nothing else, right? They really stuck out and they've got these different dark and light bands that we all uh, are probably familiar with. But you'll notice there's a little red box. You see this little box? It should be right uh, in the middle, towards the middle, right after the centromere here on this long arm of chromosome 17 here. This little red box is what is shown in the next panel, this panel down here, okay? So it's a zoom in of that region of chromosome 17 and it's busy right this 
genome browser, like all of them, suffer from it displays way too much information way too soon, right? Uh, especially if you're not used to looking at these things. There's a lot of stuff shown here. There's all these tick marks that show different information. There's all these color coding of, uh, of, uh, of features in this region. Actually, the kind of gold or, or uh, brown color that's coming across on my uh, stream here. These are the genes, right? The, the, the gold standard genes, this kind of brown colored thing. So here's ZPBP2, if you could, if you could, uh, you know, if I zoom in here, this says ZPBP2, and you can see this little red box. I'm, my mouse is moving the red line across, and it would show you down below too, but here we're right in this ZPBP2 region, right, for this variant. So that's that gene. Here's other ones, like that ORMDL3 that we mentioned before, right? And there's some other genes here too in this in this region. So that's fine, that's this region. Let me zoom back out again without uh, breaking this web browser. If we go further down, we have that region, that little region that was shown here, and this one with the red, oh, excuse me, don't wanna do that, with the little red rectangle, that is shown in the next panel down here. So I'll zoom in again. Now you're, um, notice, you know, this is uh, trying to be a bit like a Google Maps, right, where we can zoom in and zoom out and move around the genome and explore different features. We wish it was like, we wish it was as good as Google Maps, but it's not really. Okay, anyway, let's not get distracted. But here we have that region and we can zoom in. So you see these plus and minus buttons here zoom in, zoom out. Let's zoom in a little bit. You know, your setting of the zoom might be a bit different than mine. I'm going to zoom in a little bit and, and keep going. I'll do it a little bit extreme, for example, here, maybe, maybe all the way for now. So when I'm zoomed in all the way here, I actually have a view of the nucleotides. There's the forward strand, there's the reverse strand. Remember what we had for this allele? There, there it is. Right, here's the SNP, the variant. Here, okay, so this is this location. And here's our region. Okay, so we could zoom out and we can move along. You can, you can kind of, to some extent, uh, go along um, the, the strands here and, and, and navigate and see where those genes are. Let me Zoom out again a little bit. Here, I'm gonna click that, uh, zoom, zoom out a little bit more. And we would start to see um, the genes again, right? where those gene boundaries are, where the transcripts actually are, and where the exons and the introns are, and, and these things once this thing uh, eventually loads up. So here's, uh, now we're starting to see, there's that ZPB2 gene. There's the exons, the little, it's maybe hard to see. Let me see if I can zoom in. But here's, so that's the coding sequence. This is the gene, protein coding region, ZPBP2. There's the exons, there's the introns. And you could start to explore what's upstream or downstream of a particular uh, coordinate, for example, where this SNP or where some of these SNPs lie in, uh, in this region of the, in the genome. Okay, so that's a lot of information, right? This is Ensemble, and like UCSC that we're gonna see later on as well, there's a lot of stuff displayed. If I zoom back out, like look at all these different things. Here's uh, another gene, GSDMP, and I could click, and it's very easy when you're not used to using these tools to get lost and have a bad zoom setting, or you know, like I'm doing here with my mouse, trying to zoom in on these panels, and uh, I've lost it, right? Where did it go? It's just one of those things that we have to be patient with ourselves and realize that these are a little fiddly and a little tricky to use, these online uh, genome browsers here. But with practice and with time and with patience, you can extract some pretty useful information out of these browsers. Let me um, uh, abandon this browser while we're still ahead here before I, I break it with all this zooming in and zooming out. I'm going to go back to the top of this page and click back on the variant right here on this tab to get the kind of text information display.
So I'm going to click that and my uh, browser will eventually reload that tab. And what we'll see is, of course, the same information we had before about the allele, the minor allele frequencies and whatnot. And we'll also see. So here it is back. There's some boxes here, right? So uh, to go and explore different things about this uh, variant, we're gonna use uh, some of these link outs here to answer some of the other questions. The questions are gonna guide you through exploring some of these uh, features here. So let me go back for a moment to our uh, PDF worksheet and see where we are and how we're doing. So that was question three that we've answered. My question four is name at least three downstream genes for the RS8073B. How to answer that was from that uh, genome browser that we just that we played with, like ORLM, whatever that those uh, gene names were there that we uh, that we found in the genome browser. So I'll leave you to that to play with that that browser and find some of those gene regions. And it's now we're actually interested in exploring some of these link outs. We're going to first do a sample genotypes. Okay, we're interested in these SNPs because they've been found to be associated with childhood asthma, and it's we're going to go and find uh, look up um, in different populations that have been studied in these large scale sequencing projects. How common is that uh, variant that's associated with asthma, for example? If we go and look at a local population, we're going to maybe focus in on. One from Los Angeles here, Mexican ancestry uh, folks from Los Angeles. We'll see how much sequencing information there is for that population. And we'll maybe compare it to another uh, population to see if those allele frequencies differ. So let's go back to our um, web browser here. And so here I am back on the website. I'm going to click and follow my own instructions and pick on sample genotypes. We'll see the little kind of box up here, a bit like, you know, the number of unread emails in my inbox at the minute, something similar, right? 2,504 uh, genotypes, people that we actually have sequencing information for or, or uh, allele information for in this case. I'm going to click on that. And when the web page loads, it's going to load down below here. It shows me all, this is from a thousand genomes project that we mentioned in our, uh, in our videos. This is one of these projects that had an ambitious goal to go and sequence lots of people around the world in different populations. And we can see some of them here, like uh, Utah residents with Northern and Western European ancestry. There's a, there's a group of folks, 99 uh, folks that have been sequenced and we have information for, for this allele. Let's focus in on, on this one, Mexican ancestry in Los Angeles, California. It's got a code called MXL, we can focus ourselves in by using the filter box here, MXL. I push return, that just will show me that line in the table below it will, will exclude all those others. And it says there's 64 genotypes, 64 souls, people that we have information from. So I'm gonna say show. And it's gonna show me this table of, uh, of alleles. So I, uh, I'm going to check that I'm not going too fast. I know the answer to it. I'm probably going too fast. So I'm going to slow down for a little second um, and make sure we all get to the same page because what's shown here is kind of is important. It's interesting. What, what we've got, if I zoom in a little bit here, we've got this first individual. It's got, it's, you know, we don't, it's anonymized data. It's got a code NA19648 uh, and it's, F, so it's a female. This is a, a female in, of Mexican ancestry who uh, lived at a, in Los Angeles at the time of this project. And they are AA, that's the alleles they have here. And then there's somebody who's homozygous for this uh, actual asthma variant, the GG. That's a male individual. In this population, they're part of the all American uh, MXL. The part, part of those different population groups. We're looking at the MXL group, which is a subset of America, of course, which is a subset of all. And there we find somebody who's GG, and there's another AA, and here's an AG, a, a male individual who has a, an AG 
in this location. So let me make sure we all get to this. How I got to this page was I was on uh, Omen. Back here, I found the Verlin paper that I was interested in studying more or linking out to. And I found my SNPs. I clicked on the, the SNPs, these, different, these four different SNPs. We can also see the genes that these things affect here, right? That, that's the same genes that we would have saw in the genome browser there when we were exploring around. They're documented here in the Omen as well. And I clicked on one particular SNP that I was interested in learning more about, like this RS806. That um, brought up my genome browser for this, unlike the first SNP that I clicked on, which was in a gene and you know probably affects that gene. Right? This one was not in a gene. So what could this be doing? I wanted to find out more about this SNP. So I went here and looked then at, if we reload this page, I went and clicked on sample genotypes right here in this box. This is all, um, if you prefer reading uh, and pausing the video, uh, and following along, this is all in our hands-on worksheet documented. This brung me to the thousand genome data for this SNP. And there were lots of different populations I could explore. For example, there's uh, British in England and Scotland, right? I could look at some, some relatives in there maybe, right? And uh, we we're interested in a local one, so I focused in on the MXL population. And we got to that and I showed it and we've got a table. And now the question in the workbook is kind of hard to answer with this web page. You kind of hit the limits of this web interface. I'm going to ask, well, what is the proportion of that GG, who, the number of individuals who are homozygous for that asthma uh, allele in this population? And maybe we could go and look at one of the other populations and compare that proportion. Is it higher or lower in this Mexican ancestry in Los Angeles population who actually coincidentally don't have asthma as high a rate as some other populations? What is this SNP uh, frequency here? But I can't answer it, right? I've just got this listing or this table of results, table of, of individuals, uh, 64 of them in this case. What do I do, right? So if I go back here to my um, PDF workbook, what we see is we're asked, kind of answering what is the proportion of the Mexican ancestry in Los Angeles um, homozygous for this asthma associated SNP, the GG. So how would we do this? Well, we're going to do it through our old friend R, okay? So first off, we need the data to analyze. So I'm gonna go back to the web page and download that table of data or get it some way and then read it into R and see if we can determine the proportion that are GG and AA and AG and GA, etc. Okay, so let me go back to the website and see if we can download that table of, of data here. So I'm going to click here to our web page and I'll see that in this table, uh, there's a link actually right here in the corner where it's got a little icon right here. If you see that icon, looks like a little Excel sheet up here, if you can see where my mouse is. It's got an option, download what you see. If there were lots and lots of entries here, they would be paged. So the next 100 would be on the next page. And if you click this, you'd only download what you see. I want to download the whole table here. So I'm going to click that one and that will go off and go and be downloaded to my uh, computer. I'll see it here, sample genotypes. It's in my downloads directory. And now it's a, well, what do I want to do with it? Well, to do that, I'm going to go over to RStudio and I'm going to um, try and analyze this data. So I have a, a RStudio already open, but I'm going to do what I, uh, what we always do, which is file new project here, new directory, new project, and I'm going to go and um, call this one week zero eight because we're in week eight. 
of this course. And then we'll get a fresh our studio for our use today and then a fresh directory and project where we can work. Okay, so now I've got a new R Studio session open here. Let me go and create a new R Markdown document for our work today. I'm going to do file, new file, R Markdown, and we'll uh, make it a PDF, for example. Well, we don't need to submit this. Let's make it, um, yeah, let's do PDF. Why not? No, we could do HTML or PDF. I'm going to do give it a title, week eight, obsession, Barry Grant. Okay, that's me. And click OK. And then I will see uh, a document appear here in our tab with all the boilerplate code. I'm just going to go and delete all that stuff from here. I'll give myself some room to work. I'll say um, section one okay so I'm given some uh, text here I'm going to save it and it's going to ask me what file name do I want to save this is I'm just going to call it week 08 that I'm and save it and it should now appear saved right here in my uh, files panel so I know it's in this folder now I don't have any content in here yet but I need to go and don't, uh, read that file that I downloaded so I can either move that file into the project directory which is probably a good idea to do, or I could try and read it directly from my downloads folder. Um, let's um, move it into this project directory. And the reason we do that rather than reading it from the downloads folder, for example, is that uh, then when we save our project and everything will be self-contained and reproducible when we actually go and uh, add this to a version control system a little bit later. So let me pause here while what I do is I open a new file explorer here or Windows Explorer. So I'm going to click open. And you could do, if you know how to do Unix, you could do this in one command on the terminal tab, but uh, some of us don't. So I'm going to say open uh, show folder in new window here. And this opens, opens, uh, let me show you this here. This opens a finder window. If you if you can see that here, so here's a, a finder window that it just opened up. If you're on a PC, this will be a file explorer window. So this is my project directory location. I have uh, also opened one for my downloads here. You can open a new one with your downloads, and then the, my task is just to just to take this file that we just downloaded and just drag it in, just copy it in move it to my project and when I do that it makes a funny click noise and I see that it's appeared here in the in the in the, the files panel of our studio so let me zoom back in on our studio so you can see that the reason I did that is just to keep myself organized right I just want to keep my input data along with my analysis script and, and everything else so you can see that right here Let's see this three seven very catchy name, but that's the name that we got from the from Ensemble. So now I'm going to read this. This is a CSV file, so we're going to use our good old friend. Um, so here, downloaded. Let me put some notes for myself. Downloaded CSV file from. Ensemble, we could put the web link in here from where we downloaded it if you're if you're motivated to do that. I'm going to it's a bit of a long one. But I'm gonna paste that in just from my my web browser. Okay. And here we read 
a CSV file and then determine the allele frequency. So let's insert a code chunk for this, give myself some room. Here, so I'm going to uh, insert a code chunk and you can use the little buttons insert R here, or you can use the shortcut, or you can type it out directly yourself. I'm gonna use the shortcut, control or command, um, option I on my Mac keyboard or control alt the Windows button Alt I if you're on a if you're on a PC. So I'm going to read this in. I'm going to make my font a little bigger so we can see what's going on. So I'm going to call this MXL of Mexican Ancestry in Los Angeles. I'm going to do read.csv and then I'm going to give it my file name. And it's a bit of a long winded old file name, so I'm going to just type three seven and push tab. And this will autocomplete for me so I don't have to type it all out myself or you know because I would make a mistake typing this out. So I'm gonna look at that. I can do head of MXL here to view it and I'm gonna run run that code chunk and I get a little preview of it. Let me turn this off because it's not that useful and actually just click over here to get a view of it. So here it is here's the the, um, the data that we've read in. So there's a column and we could set it as a row name if we wanted, but we'll, we'll not do that in this case. And there's a column with the genotype. See the AA, GG, this is the same information that we saw on our, on our, on the webpage, on the Ensemble webpage. And our task is to determine the proportion of them that are GG, like this male individual, for example. So how could we do that? Well, first thing is we want to get to that data, that column of data. So I'm going to go back to my R Markdown document and I'm going to see if I can get to that column of data. I've called it MXL. I'm going to look for that column. I'll use the dollar syntax, dollar. And it's going to, our studio is going to try and help me and say, do you mean this column or this column? Which one is it? I want. And we could clean up these column names with the janitor package or something like that if you're used to it, but I'm, I'm not going to bother because we're only going to do this once here. So I'm going to take the MXL thing and let's see what this prints out. It prints out all the genotypes. Awesome. We're getting close. I'm going to use a function that we used a lot last day, in our last hands-on session called table to summarize this um, set of data and that'll tell me the number of each occurrence in here. So in this case, there was 22 AAs, 21 AGs, 12 GAs, and only nine GGs, only nine uh, uh, folks were homozygous for this asthma associated SNP, the GG. GG, side note, is what my little son calls horses, so the GGs. Right? Anyway, so GG is what we're after, but we want to know what proportion. The question asked, what's the proportion in this data set in this population that we, uh, that we have here. So how do we do that? Well, I could just calculate a fraction. So I've got the same thing I did above. Okay, so I would do the table. I could copy it again or I can write it out. I'm just gonna write it out MXL dollar. There's my genotype, so that's the same answer as before. And I could divide that by what I need to divide it by, just like if I'm going to calculate my you know, score in a test, I need to know the total number of points that were available in that test. Here, I need to know the total number of individuals that are in this data set, and I could get that from n row, n row of the MXL. That would tell me how many rows, how many, because it's a row per person. So that would give me a proportion. So it will tell me that. Um, 14, 0.14 is GG. If I wanted this as a percentage, I can just multiply by 100 here, and this will tell me that it's 14% uh, that are GG. So the answer here is 14% or homozygous for this asthma associated SNP in this Mexican ancestry Los Angeles population. Let's, uh, you know, I don't know if that's big or low, uh, Let's go and compare it to another population, maybe. Let's do this. This isn't in the workbook, but let's do it just for kicks and giggles. 
and say, yeah, let's go to that British population, right? The, the GBR population. So I'm going to go back and get the data in the same way I did for the Mexican ancestry in Los Angeles population. I'm going to get it for that GBR, I think it was called. We'll, we'll check what it's called. We'll download the file. We'll do the same thing again, just so you get the repetition of that and, and practice of that. This is all good practice for getting at bits of data that we want to get at to compute things off. That's the core of using these languages and these analysis routines productively is being able to do that. Uh, so let me save this script here. I'm going to, because it's in blue, I'm going to just save my work so far. I'm going to go back to Ensemble, get off the MXL population and go on to a different population and download that data. So here, let me go back to our website. So here we are back in uh, back in the in this thing. I can take this MXL off. And here's all the different ones I want. Let's do British in England and Scotland. This is this GBR population. So I'll just focus in on that. GBR, for example, that will show us. And I'm gonna go show. So there were 90, it said there were how many did it say? That's it still has the MXL on it. This has 91 folks in it. I can, maybe there's more GGs here. Let's let's go find out. So I'm gonna download, make sure I'm on this GBR population. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna download the whole table. That goes off and goes to my downloads folder. I'm gonna go back here now and uh, make sure that I have this document in my downloads and I'm going to drag it into my project directory. So I'll show you doing that. So here I am back is my full screen here. I've got my project directory open. If you don't have this open, let's demonstrate how to do it. So I'm going to say here, I'm, I've squished this in a little bit. Let me, let me unsquish it for the, this more button, more show folder, a new window. That opens it up right here. So this is my project directory. I could check that because it says week 08 on it. And then I've got the other finder window here that's already open in my downloads folder with all my downloads, things like images. What's that? Oh yes, that's inappropriate. But okay, let's not show that. Here's one. Uh, here's the thing that we just downloaded. Let's bring that in. Bump. Okay, we have our new CSV file. It's got a slightly different name. It's got the 2.2 in it here rather than the 3.1. It's maybe hard for you to see that. Let's focus back on our studio and see if we can read this one in. So here I am back, maybe more visible and more readable in our studio. So let me give myself some more room. Let's write some notes for myself now. Let's look at a different population. I picked the GBR population. You could pick another one, but you can also stick with the one I'm. This is uh, Great Britain, basically the UK, right? So it's called Great Britain because there used to be a lesser Britain, not because it's particularly great used to be a lesser Britain called Brittany in the north of France. Anyway, let's read this data in the same way. I'm going to call it GBBR. I'm going to uh, use the same read.csv function and I'm quotes. And then I don't want to type the whole thing out, but I need to type enough to be unique. So I can type three. It's not going to autocomplete it. It's going to tell me which one do you want, boss, right? It's trying to help me here, right? behind my head here, right? So I want the first one because remember that the 2-2 two -two was the was the number that, that other one is the earlier one, that's the Mexican ancestry in Los Angeles. We could rename these files if you, if you wished. I'm just gonna select that top one, that's the GBR one. Let's make sure that that's not the one we read before by just scrolling up. Yeah, you see we read the three one here, that's the MXL population. Here, we're gonna read the GBR population. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna read that in. 
I now have that available in my environment. So here it is. I've got the same setup, the same column here. So let me go on and um, analyze that. I'll do a new code chunk here. Find proportion of G, G. So let me put in a new code chunk. I'm doing the shortcut for that. Again, you can use the button if you don't, uh, if you can't remember the shortcut. Sometimes you have to be like a Vulcan to use these things, but it's uh, Command uh, Option I or, or Control Alt I on a PC. I'm going to do, I'm going to call this, um, well, let's do our get the data first, the GBR dollar genotype forward strand. Let's make sure, just suck it and see as I go along. Yep, that looks like the genotype to me. I'm going to do table of that. And I'm going to make sure that that's working. So I'm going to do it step by step. So, oh, it's, it's actually higher. So, uh, well, the total number is higher too. So 27, let me check uh, by dividing it by n row of GBR in this case. So this would be our proportion. And it, it is higher. It's almost 30% here. We can multiply by 100 to get the percentage. We could round it off with the round function to to uh, to uh, do that. Let's let's show that. Let's round it. So I'm going to go back to the start and use the round function, and I'll round it to. If you just do it with no arguments on it, it'll round it to the nearest. I think I actually want to round it to two significant figures. So I'll do comma two here. Let me um, make this a little bigger. It's getting a little complicated, this line of code, but it'll tell me that it's 29.67%. So it's actually more than twice the amount of, uh, twice the proportion of that 14% that we saw in the Mexican ancestry Los Angeles population. There's um, there's 29% here in um, here in this Great Britain population. And asthma is actually relatively high in that population compared to compared to some others. So that's maybe interesting, right? It's a it's a correlation. It's definitely not a causation. It's probably bogus, right? Uh, insight, but it's an interesting thing. So let's pause here for a minute and think about what we could do. Why don't we go and, you know, we've got this, this data, right? We've got these uh, alleles here and we've figured out their frequency. We've almost done a GWAS study ourselves here. Right. Um, why don't we go and see if this actually matters, right? If having a GG here, right? If we pick an individual here, like this one, this is a female. Let's pick uh, uh, something like this. We'll pick one that's homozygous for this this allele, like this uh, male HG zero zero one zero seven. Right. That's the code for this individual and their GG. Let's go and see. We can go on to the Thousand Genome Project, pull other data for this individual via that code, HG00107, and go analyze that data and see if it affects the expression of those genes that were in this region, right? If this really matters, maybe this type of uh, individual has an altered gene expression for those genes that seem to be important for asthma. That's one thing we could explore, one follow-up. So this brings us actually nicely to section two of our uh, of our hands-on session so let's go and have a read of that and see where we're going i'm going to save my work to date here in our studio and i can write a little note for myself this variant that is associated with childhood asthma is more frequent in the aisle. I'm typing without looking because of the way my screen is set up. I have multiple things open, so you have to excuse me. I've probably misspelled all sorts of things. Childhood variant. OK, 
Okay, so I'm just writing the note so I know what's going on. Let's now dig into this further. You know, it's something interesting, something that piques our interest here. We're going to see if we can explore it further, right? That's that's the kind of idea. So I'll uh, see if that. And let's go back to our, our Markdown document and see how we get on with that. So not our Markdown, sorry, our, our uh, PDF, our, our workbook. Okay, so we are... Uh, Back on the ensemble, oh, there's something else to do. So here, back on the ensemble page, use a search for a sample field above to find a particular sample. So here I'm asking for HG109. Actually, this is one of those individuals that was in our last table. We saw HG00107 and others. Let's go and see how we would uh, find this individual and find out what, um, what genotype they have for this particular SNP. So it's asking me for HG0109. Let's go uh, and do that for this question. So here I'm on my uh, web page. And in this case, what I want to do is I'm going to scroll back up and see it says search for a sample up here. Right, so here's the top of the page for this particular SNP. Make sure you're working on the same SNP. If you're not, you'll get you know different answers, of course, if you're on a different SNP. I'm going to paste that. Uh, name here and push return and it'll show or focus me on that individual. This is a male. I should have picked a female, but never mind. Male will define. Uh, and they're homozygous for this asthma associated SNP. They're GG in this location. This is part of the population all, part of the population European, part of the population GBR. See the way it's it's listed here. Okay. So this is a person from that British population, the one that we just looked at and showed that it had twice the frequency than the, the previous population we looked at. So let's go and explore this person further. Let's go on and, and, uh, and see that in the next section. So in section two, what we start to go is now we want to understand whether the SNP will affect gene expression. We can find, you can go to the thousand genome project page and if you have permissions you can go and start uh, downloading data from it for these individuals. I've actually taken the liberty of doing that for us just to make things a little uh, easier and more transparent for us. So uh, on our class website or these links here I actually have the sequencing data, the FASTQ files that came from the the sequencer uh, here. This was a luminous sequencing that was done per and the luminous sequencing as we discussed in our in our um, in our videos for this section. So there's FASTQ1, FASTQ2. These are the two files that are associated with paired end sequencing. And we're going to go and download these. So I'm going to click on them here, click and click. So they're in our downloads folder. And we're going to go and start to analyze them. We're actually going to do a complete RNA-seq analysis of this data that's just from the sequencer. So what we're going to use for this section is uh, a, a, a server, a, a resource, a tool called Galaxy. Now Galaxy, as you'll see here, it's a, it's a web front end essentially to a bunch of Unix tools, right? So um, we could go and go to a Unix command line on a server somewhere uh, and start installing all these tools individually that we would use to do the processing of these reads and the mapping of them to a reference genome and, and the differential expression analysis and things like that that we're going to do. Uh, uh, but that's kind of uh, painful, right, to start installing all that software, getting it up and running and, and, and all these things. So a great way to start our exploration of this, where we'll see the whole workflow, is to use a tool like Galaxy. Galaxy is really great for starting out in this field. And so I have sent each and every one of you an email it was kind of automatically generated when I set up these servers. They're running on Amazon Web Services. Amazon is a major cloud provider. It's what Netflix runs on. And, and you know, a lot of those modern web uh, companies, they actually rent computing from Amazon or from other service providers like it. Amazon is one of the main ones. And so I've done that too. And I've started a brand new computer 
that's all set up and ready to run with Galaxy on it. Now there is, uh, you know, if you're doing this later and you don't have access to that server that I sent you the link to, there is a public web address called usegalaxy.org. You see this link here. This is a public server here. Um, uh, you can use that. Uh, of, co of course, you can set up an account, as I'll show you in a moment, and you can use that for some limited uh, bioinformatics work. Unfortunately, if everyone in this class, or even just a handful of us, went to this website and started to try and do the work that we're going to do right now on it, it would grind to a halt. Right? It would, just wouldn't support all of this working on this public server. And it's not fair. You know, it's free resources that they're making available to the community, and we shouldn't uh, abuse them in, the, in, in that way. So I've set up a, a server, an individual server for each of you. So you'll need to go and find that email address that was in this announcement and go click and find your server. And when you click on it, what you'll get is a web page that looks like this. Okay, so I'm going to go and, and do that too. So I'm going to go here and I'll actually pull that up. Right, the email and click on my one. Okay, I'll do this and then I'll show you it in a second. So... Okay, so here I've opened my own automatically generated email and we're back. So this is my Galaxy server running here. You have your own one, your own URL that'll be unique to you. But just in case someone else somehow finds that URL so, or, or, uh, or you've shared it or something with some other class, I want you to click up here to the login screen. First, actually, well, Let's let's explain what we're looking at first. So it's a web, it's a web page as you can see, right? It's open in my web browser, and it's got some panels. There's a panel over on the far side, which says tools right at the top of it. Right? So see, over here, I'm talking about. Right? This is says says tools. So this is a listing of all the kind of Unix tools that are underneath installed on this Unix machine that you're working on at the minute. That this is a front end to, and we'll 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 explore these in a second. Then we have a middle panel here that at the minute just displays this welcome page. This is Galaxy running on the cloud, etc., etc. It's just telling you some information about that. Then over here, it's called the history. We don't have anything in it. It's empty and it's unnamed because we haven't created an account for ourselves. We haven't done any work on this yet. So we'll see how these three panels kind of come in to play and how we navigate between the three of them. Uh, when we actually do something in a second. But before we do that, let's create a account for ourselves. So I'm going to go up here to the top and see where it says login or register. I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to say register because I haven't logged in before. And this is a brand new, fresh computer just started uh, this morning for you. So here it's going to ask me for an email address and a password. I'm going to use uh, any email address. I'll use my gmail one for example and the password you can accept this you know this password is being suggested by uh, by this web browser i'm not going to bother with that this is not a particular we don't need to keep this very secure i'm just going to pick something short and easy to type my public name i'll just do barry and i'm going to say submit okay so pick whatever you want just make sure you enter it in the password the same in both boxes uh, it's not going to email you or do anything uh, with this information it's just creating an account on this um, server this galaxy server and we're going to um, delete these instances these servers these machines that are running on the cloud after we're done with them anyway so this will all be hosed so i'm not going to see if the password here it is i'm going to make sure that i'm logged in so i click log in it says you're already logged in so you might have to there's a little glitch there when uh, whenever you register and then you click it you're not actually logged in you kind of have to click log in so please make sure it says logged in as and your name up here right so here it says i'm logged in as me so make sure you have uh, that when you click the, the user button if you don't it means you haven't logged in or maybe the registration didn't work properly so please try and do that. What this will allow us to do is it'll allow us to save our work. Okay. And it'll also keep us separate in case anyone else works on the same 
a server that we do. It'll keep our work separate from them and we'll not get confused. Okay, and that's that's good practice. If you use the public Galaxy instance at that usegalaxy.org, you have to do this, right? Here you don't have to because you know, it's your own computer and you can do whatever you like with it. But in this case, it's good practice anyway. So I'm doing that. So I've logged in. Oh, excuse me. Let's uh, let's go back there. So the idea here with Galaxy is we're going to use some tools. For example, we, we, we search here. There's a tool I want to use called FastQC, for example. And I can type it in here, and it would show me some of them. Or if you didn't you know, know the name of it, you can go and look in all the different areas that you can do work in. For example, the first NGS analysis section down here says N. GSQC and manipulation, that's for quality control and manipulation. I'm going to pick one of these here, it's pseudo random. I pick this one, FastQC, and it opens up a central panel where I can actually give input to this program and when it's uh, and run it, right? Okay, when I click execute, if I had the input all set up properly, it would go off and execute underneath the surface. It just goes and runs a Unix command to run this program, okay, and it'll show me the results appearing here. I don't have any actual data uploaded here or anything to work on yet, so it's a little bit dull. I can't actually do anything. See up here it says no FastQ files are available, nothing. I can't do anything, boss, it's telling me. So we need to get some data. So let's go and get some uh, data. And that's the data that I give on that class website, those FastQ files. We'll talk about what those FastQ files are in just a second. They're from the sequencer. But let's get them up here. Let's get them running. I'm going to go get data, and I'm uh, so there's a lot of different options here for get data. You can get it from different places. I'm there's one called upload file. Do you see that? It says upload file. This one, we're just going to upload our data to this server. So I click that, I'm too zoomed in, and it allows me here to choose local files. And there's an important step here. So I'm going to choose local files, and it'll bring up a a browser. This is to your computer. This is in my downloads folder. You can see all these things. I've got these two files that I just downloaded. I'm going to select both of them and click choose and it'll bring up this dialog. Please don't click start just yet. What I want to point to you is, so here it's got, it, nothing's happened yet because I haven't clicked the start button. It's got this column that says type for the type of file that we're uploading. And this is important for uh, Illumina sequencing data, the sequencing platform that we discussed in our videos, of course. These are a particular format of FASTQ files from the latest version of the Illumina sequencers, so-called version 1.8. I'll have a slide on this in a second, but we, what we need to do is tell it the format of these files. And I haven't explained that format to you yet, but I will in a second. But let's check that this is working. So I'm going to do f uh, type in, it, it says it's going to auto-detect in my experience this auto detect sometimes doesn't work properly. And in fact, this is an example where it doesn't work properly and classifies them as a different type of file. And then that will cause all sorts of heartache later on if you get this wrong. If you just let it go with auto detect, you can cause these weird problems that we don't, uh, that we don't want. So I'm gonna be explicit about the type of file that we have here and just tell it that these are called FASTQ Sanger. So I'm gonna type it out, F-A-S-T-Q, S-A-N-G-E-R. See, see, it's kind of uh, trying to auto um, guide me, but I'm making sure I type fast Q Sanger. Okay, not fast Q C Sanger or fast uh, some, something else, blah, blah, blah. There's quite a few different options there that begin with fast. Don't be lazy, just type it out. So fast Q Sanger, I'm going to do the same for this one. So F A S. See, it's suggesting all these different things like faster that we've seen before, I'm going to do fast Q Sanger. I'm going to make sure it does the right one. Okay. And then what I can do is say start. And this will go start to go green. Okay. What you'll also see underneath, if I close this panel once it's gone green, is that over here in my history, I've got two little gray uh, entries for these files. And if I click on one of the sex, he says this job is waiting to run. The server hasn't been used really yet, so it's going to take a minute for it to start uploading those data sets. As it's doing that, you can click the little refresh up here. What'll happen is once this job starts to run, it'll go yellow. 
Now, once it finishes, it'll go green, like a traffic light thing, right? It's green, you're ready to go, and we can do stuff with it. Until it's green, we can't actually do anything. So let's hold on for a minute. You'll hopefully start to see those go green if this thing uh, works for us. As we're waiting, I'm going to go back. You know, recall that these are relatively big data sets that we get from these sequencers. I'm going to go back here to my uh, slides and we're going to talk about what we're doing. So this was our workflow to date with our looking up for the Veerland study and our SNPs and this was our genome browser uh, and this is Galaxy. So you'll see here in this uh, screenshot, for example, I've done some work and these have all gone green here. That means the success, right? That this thing's worked. So that's Galaxy. So the the overall procedure that we're going to do, let me see if I can find the slide for this. These things, you, you know, we're going to take these raw reads from the sequencer. That's the you know, little MySeq sequencer here that, that uh, spits out these fast Q files. This is the format this thing reads. So we need to take these reads and uh, combine them. You'd either do de novo assembly, but in our case, it's human data. We've got a reference human genome. So we're just gonna map them by alignment to the human genome here. And uh, so they typically come in FASTQ format. Now we've saw in the past FASTA format, right? FASTA format, and this is the simplest sequence format around, right? It just has that little more than sign a name for the sequence, the identifier so-called. And then on the next line, it just has the sequence. I'm showing X's here, but this could be, you know, your nucleotides if it's a nucleotide sequence. And then the next entry would start with the next identifier. That's how the program knows that there are two sequences here. Now FASTQ is an adaptation of this for NGS data. So fast Q format, it's, it's got the Q in it, and we'll talk about what the Q means in a second, but these things look similar, but different, right? For a start, they have an at symbol, you know, like the one you would use in your emails, the at identifier, that's the first line. And then we have you know, the same sort of freeform comment. Normally from Illumina, this tells you something about the flow cell and the coordinates and, and, and whatnot that's in there, but we'll have a sequence identifier. Then on the second line, We'll actually have the nucleotides. We'll have the read, the data, right? The stuff we really care about, with the A, C, Gs, and Ts that we're actually interested in determining here. Then we have a plus, and then we have this line of, and I'm showing them as Qs, this is the quality score. So we'll talk about what this is in a second. So here is a FASTQ format file, okay? I'm actually, uh, we'll walk through the different lines in this, but let's check I, in the background here, I see that my Galaxy server is alive and running and my things have gone green. So why don't we uh, just check on that for a second just to make sure and we'll come back to this slide in a moment. So here it is, mine's gone uh, green here. So here, this was originally gray, if you remember. Then it went yellow when it was running and then it's finally gone green. You should be able to see that. If I click on the little eye icon, or if I click on the name, it'll tell me that there's 4,000 odd sequences. The format is FASTQ Sanger. It gives you a little preview of it. I'm just gonna click on the little, see the little I? There's an edit button and there's a delete button. The little I will actually show me the file. If I click on this, it'll show me the data. This is our FASTQ sequences or a portion of it. And it's just like that, uh, um, let me zoom in a minute. We've got the at symbol. This is the identifier. Then we've got our comments that tells us about the the sequencing flow cell, et cetera, et cetera. Then the main, the business end, right? That's the nucleotide. So this read starts with T, 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 C, T, G, T, right? Those are the actual nucleotides we're sequencing. Then we have a plus symbol. Then we have this quality score. And it looks weird. See, it's got this at in it and the equals in it. Sometimes it's got exclamation marks in it. These are ASCII characters. And there's one character per nucleotide. So this D, here, that corresponds to the T here, and this D, 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 and then that C, for example, that quality score corresponds to that T. Let me go back to the slide for a minute, and then the next read starts, okay? There's read one, this one I've highlighted is read two, for example. Let me go back to the slide where I walk through these different lines so we make sure we're on the same page here. So the first one is, uh, is this, line right always starts with an at and it's a unique identifier 
for the sequence that follows. Then the second line contains the base calls, right? This is the actual sequence fragment that we're interested in. Then we have a plus character and we often you know, count up the number of, of pluses. It can be a little dangerous, but we can count the number of pluses to determine the number of sequences, for example. And then we have this peculiar line, this quality score line. That's where the Q comes from in the file name. These are ASCII encoded quality scores. It tells us, from, this comes from the sequencer, it tells us how confident we are that that nucleotide in the corresponding position in line two there is, is good, that we're sure that it's correct. Right? Or maybe we're not so sure, maybe where there's an ambigu ambiguous that call, we weren't quite sure what uh, nucleotide we call here. So let's focus in on this fourth line for a second. Each sequence base has one of these quality scores, as we said. They're ASCII characters. They're actually, um, you know, all the things like exclamation mark, all the, the, the things that we have on our keyboards. And the printable ones, the ones that don't make your computer go beep or flash the screen and all sorts of other things, they actually start from character 33 and run to 126. Okay, so they're unfortunately and that's why we spelled out exactly what format our files were. Different variants of Illumina sequencing, different generations of it, uh, or versions have different uh, ways to encode these quality scores. So here's the ASCII characters up at the top in the, in the gray here. You see the exclamation mark, the quotes, the hash, the dollar, the, the percent. They all stand for numbers, right? We can include, we, those will represent numbers uh, from 33 to one, two, six, right? So we can use those to represent individual numbers. And the, the reason we use, of course, one character is because we want to keep that clear correspondence, straightforward correspondence between how, what's the quality of this individual base, which is one character, nucleotide C, right? We, want, we don't want to write, we're 99.9% .9 certain it's correct because that would be lots of characters, right? And then we lose the, lose the, the correspondence between character and quality score. So we use this way to encode those numbers. And the latest version of Illumina sequencing at the time that we're doing this and the time that that was run is Illumina 1.8. Also corresponds to the old Sanger format. So people call it Sanger sequencing or FASTQ Sanger format. And that runs from 33 uh, all the way to, to the end, to 126. So it means that when we read these quality scores, we need to tell it that's the format because these other ones are different here in the, the earlier generations of Illumina. So that's why we need to tell it the FASTQ Sanger format. And if we were motivated, and we'll maybe skip this step, we would go and we could read out uh, in, in R, we could take that quality score line and determine the number, what's called the FRED score. It comes from a, an older uh, program called FRED that used to, to calculate the quality scores of these things. We could convert them from the ASCII uh, to, to uh, from a character to a string and then ASCII to numbers and then we could subtract that offset to minus 33 and determine our FRED score. We'll, we'll skip this step because we'll see them in a second. So what we're going to do is we have two files. Of course, this is paradigm sequencing, so we read in. We've got a forward read and a reverse read. Most data you'll see these days is, is paradigm. It's the, the cost advantage used to have from doing single end sequencing is is not really a driving factor anymore. So most folks will do paired end sequencing like this, where we have a forward and a reverse read, these, these pairs here. So we're gonna take these FASTQ files, the format that we've just seen, we, we may have optional replicates. In our case, we're just gonna take, uh, just take one. We're gonna go on, first thing as always, is do quality control. We're gonna run a program called FASTQC. We're gonna get a report and look at it. Then we're gonna go and do mapping to our genome. If we're happy with our data, we don't need to rerun anything. We don't need to babysit it or do anything to it. We're gonna go and map it or align it to a reference genome. We'll get our reference genome from UCSC, from that uh, genome database. And that'll give us an alignment format called uh, SAM that you can read about on our class website. Then from those mapped reads, we're gonna go and count them. Cap count how many reads are mapped to a given uh, gene. We'll get the gene annotations of the regions that are particular genes, again from UCSC, in a particular file format called GTF, and that will give us a table where we've just counted up the number of reads for each gene, and that's our kind of workflow for today. So let's go and do this on Galaxy now in the next few minutes. We're going to do this quality control step first. We're going to run this program 
called Fast QC. So let's pop back over to Galaxy here. Uh, this is me back in Galaxy. I'm just displaying this file and I'm kind of zoomed in. So I'm going to zoom back out. I'm going to uh, search for a tool. I'm going to do Fast QC up here. This will just show me the different options. I've got some, some, some different ones. I'm going to pick the Fast QC one here. Read quality reports. And here I'm going to click, oh, let's just do it for one of them for, for time constraints. You can do it for, for both individually, for example. And it tells you about the program, you know, Fast QC. It says here it aims to provide a simple way to do some quality control checks on raw sequence data coming from high throughput sequencing pipelines. So, and you can read more about it. There's also a link here to FastQC, and, and, and we can learn about the statistics that it does uh, and more about those reports by following those links. This is all within Galaxy here. I'm just going to go and click Execute, and we'll see that the central page turns green. This thing is gray. This will turn yellow as it starts to run. See, it's, it's running here. It's producing two outputs, these, both these entries here. There's one called a web page and one called raw data. So it's, it's worked. It's finished. So we could look at the raw data. I can click the little eye icon beside it here. And this is text you know, that we could read into R or, or do something with. Uh, it's a bit dull and boring by itself here. The actual web page one, the second link here, I'm going to click on it. It's a lot more interesting. So when I click on it, it gives me a fast QC uh, report. And it's kind of, uh, I've engineered some things in here to be a little bit more interesting um, in this data set. So it's got some traffic light kind of like um, thing going on here where green is good and happy and we're fine with it and we're good to continue. And red is, uh oh, maybe you want to pay attention here and see what's wrong. And the orange is, you know, be aware, right? caution. So let's have a look at some of these things. It tells me the file name, total number of sequences in it, percent GC content is around 50% here. And the first thing is, that's the basic statistics, the per base sequence quality is this plot. And what this is, is a plot of those quality scores across all, remember that line in our FASTQ file, we had our quality scores. So this is the distribution of those quality scores across in the first box plot here. For the first position in the read, and then the second position, third position across all the reads in this file. So we get a little distribution. And here, let me go to our slides for a second where we can uh, uh, more freely kind of discuss this. this. So this is our fast QC report. And what we have here is quality control. It's an essential step that we do at the start of every MGS analysis, we, we want to know if our data is good quality, right? Because if we have crap data, we're going to get crap results, no matter how fancy the bioinformatics we're going to do on it is. So we're going to uh, look at these sorts of things. Here's a QC report of a bad sequence, right? Actually one that's that's not great. This is not like the sequence we just run, which is actually rather good quality. But here we see that the, the quality score tails off pretty dramatically into this red zone, this, this danger zone. Okay, so here is one more like ours here. And so these are the FRED scores. And when you're up above, as we notice that we are here in, in the, the green region, so we're up above in that 29, 30 position, that means that the interpretation of that is that about one in every 1,000 uh, bases is going to be incorrect. Or that's an accuracy or base call accuracy of 99.9% .9 accurate. If we're up near the 40 there, that's one in 10,000 bases, that's correct. That's 99.99% accuracy, really good accuracy. And we can see here that this box plot, it's actually the median that's shown by that line, right? That's, that's there in the, in, the, in the boxes, the mean slightly lower, the black line. So then we've got the median here shown in the boxes. That's a good quality reads. And you'll see there's a bit of a tail off towards the end as there is in our, both of our, uh, FASTQ files that we read in, and this is very common to see in Illumina data, right? With uh, you know, as the read gets longer and longer, the 
the machine starts to have more difficulty in calling accurately the base, which is the intrinsic limit to the read length of this technology as things start to get out of phase in the in the little cluster in the flow cells that we're that we're uh, that we're analyzing. So it gives us this short short read length limit that we have with the luminous sequencing. Here we see this quality is still pretty good right up to the end of these uh, reads in this particular uh, example. So we're happy to proceed. If we scroll down in the report, you would see things like the partile quality. So this is going to uh, show you how it deviates from the average across a flow cell. So inside Illumina uh, flow cells, you have a little code about where it comes from, and that's, in, that's in, uh, stored in that FASTQ file in the comment section. And when you see these kind of reports, hot colors, those reds, they're going to indicate uh, portions of the flow cell that had worse quality reads on average than, than the majority of, of the flow cell, suggesting you know some potential problems with your flow cell. Maybe there's bubbles or gunk or something or debris going through your flow cell. And if you see a lot of this, it's it's time to you know, think about rerunning your your sequencing, for example, or or uh, or not considering that file for further analysis, for example. Now another one. Uh, that's important to look at is the pervious sequence content. Now, all being all being equal, you know you would. So here it's showing for the the different nucleotides A, C, G, and T. You'd expect them all to be twenty five percent, right? You'd expect them all to be kind of common if you had a fifty percent GC content kind of genome, and they should start to uh, level off and be kind of equal here. Now. Uh, the, the kind of idea here, especially with RNA-seq, it'll nearly always produce this biased sequence composition at the start of reads because of our kind of setup. And we see that indeed with our data. And of course, I've undersampled our data, so we see some wiggle here. But the idea with real data that you're working with in the future, like this data, is you, you want to start to see these uh, plateau off around the same sort of value, unless you have a reason that you know of that they should be different. Otherwise, that's going to... Uh, indicate there's some bias in what you've actually sequenced compared to what you would expect and you would want to figure out why that is. You also uh, can look at the GC content. This is a little hist histogram here that's produced across our data set and it's usually um, normally distributed like we see here and if you have sharp peaks or other uh, strange things on these distributions again this is going to indicate some problems that were probably contamination that we see or that this adapter is left in there or something that we don't uh, want to see in our in our data that you'd want to pay attention to. And we're fine in our case and we can go on to look at, uh, at, these, at these data sets with other methods. So, you know, if you do see problems with those kind of things in the future, approaches include, you know, you can remove individual sequences that have poor overall quality Right with small mean quality scores, for example, or if there are too many ends, that's you know the ambiguous uh, nucleotide that's put in there when the when the sequencer doesn't know what base to put in there, or that uh, you could filter them based on their GC content, and you could trim the ends of reads if they're really dropping off towards the end. You know, most people now don't don't necessarily do this because sequencing is getting so much cheaper. You know, we might just rerun our sequencing job if you have the sample available to, to use okay so in worst case scenario you know you're back to the back to rerunning it right you don't want to put crap into the next steps of your analysis only to find out after you've done lots and lots of computation which after all is becoming the, the most expensive portion the most time consuming portion that you know your input data was not not good enough to support the kind of work that you want to do so we're going to go on here and um, go on to our next step in our workflow. This is alignment or mapping of these reads back to our back to, to our reference genome. So mapping, as we've said, it uses a reference genome as a guide. Otherwise, we, you know, we can think of an alignment. We're going to align these reads back to our reference genome. Uh, and there are lots of different alignment tools. Right? There are many distinct tools for doing this, as I'm mentioning here in the second point. Which one we choose is often a reflection of uh, the you know, our personal preference. We're going to pick one that's actually rather old. So here's, you can't read this, but the, the link's at the top. This is a review of lots of different mapping tools. And there, there's some modern ones that I really like that, that um, don't require alignment that we'll, that we'll talk about in our next section of our, of our course. But we're going to actually pick one here that's Top Hat 2 that's been used for a long time, that was used by 
the authors of the next study that we're going to do in our workflow. So we're going to keep uh, keep with their their model. We're going to use Top Hat two. It's a little slower, as we'll see. This is the most time consuming step of our workflow today. Some of the more modern tools are a little bit faster and give kind of equivalent. Well, they do give equivalent results, but we're going to go and, and do that. So we're going to run back to Galaxy and start our job off. And you'll see that when, when I tried this uh, on these servers, although they're quite powerful machines, it is going to take a, a rather long time, you know, 20 minutes or so to run this job. So let's get started now, and then we can go have a cup of tea, right? That would be nice. Take a break and answer questions. So I'm back on my Galaxy. I'm going to close this uh, limit to FastQC. I'm going to type in top hat here. This is top hat two that we're actually going to run, but it's just called top hat. So, you, and you're very welcome to explore any of these other tools, the more modern ones like Salmon or uh, Calesto or Sailfish or any of these other ones. We're just going to stick with the workflow of uh, the authors of the next work that we're going to do, for example. So here I'm going. So here I've clicked on top hat, and I've pulled up the the input page for top hat. Uh, our data is paired end and it says individual data sets because we have FASTQ1 and FASTQ2. So it's paired end data. So make sure this says one and two in it. So here, let me zoom in and show you what I'm changing. So here I've got paired end, I've got FASTQ1, FASTQ2. Our intermediate distance, this is the, you know, the distance between the fragments here. Uh, this is going to be 150. This comes from you know, how we've set up, or how the author set up the library that they uh, that they use for sequencing. That's the fragment length, right? Minus those, um, uh, you know, each base is 50 base pairs. So you can read it here. You know, for example, per end runs with fragments selected at 300 base pairs, where each end is 50 base pairs should uh, be set to 200. We have actually 150 is our setting here. The other thing, the only other thing to change beyond checking that we have per end. We have our appropriate FASTQ files. We have this 150 intermediate distance. Is we're not going to align, we're going to use a built in genome, but we're not going to use Baboon, right? Although, well, it's maybe appropriate sometimes, but let's, let's make sure we're doing human. So, H U M, and those are, they used HG19, so we're going to do the same. That's the, the version of the human genome there different versions as we get more and more information and make the thing better and better. So we're going to pick HG19 uh, in this in this section here for the reference genome. And then we're just going to go execute. So when this goes off and executes, we'll see this thing as gray initially, then it starts to turn yellow. So that means it's working. It's going to produce all these different outputs that we'll talk about once they're done. I'm actually going to go and uh, uh, click on one of these things. So here I'm going to click. Uh, plus, you see, see so there's no data here yet. Right? So if I click on the eye icon, nothing is displayed because it hasn't finished running yet. What we can click on, you see, is the little eye button, the information button. Don't click on the one that says, that has the, the uh, don't click on this one that I'm highlighting because that will rerun it again. And that's that sucks because we'll have to wait even longer. But I'm going to click on the view details here and see what's displayed. So what's when I do that, I get information about the job, how Galaxy uh, run this and what time it ran it. So it's you know, today's Thursday, 21st of May. And this is this is actually running on Amazon East so over in Virginia, the, the servers over in Virginia. So on the times set funny, there, there's, that's the, the time that we're uh, started this job it was created and there's all sorts of information about it you know what is this paired end data yes what's the input yes yes the kind of things we set and you see here in black right this is the command line all galaxy well galaxy does a lot for us and looks after a lot of things for it. i don't mean to it's an awesome tool and uh, a great tool to teach with but what it's doing underneath it is just running a unit at its core it does a lot of other things, of course, but what it's really doing is running this Unix command, and that's the Unix command. So it runs a code program called Top Hat Two, and then it sets a parameter number of threads, the number of threads we have in this machine, 
there's our parameter. Remember we said the mate distance minus r 150. Okay, it uses the human genome build hg13, and then takes our data set and runs it. So it's running this Unix command, and it's looking after typing it out properly for us and running it. You know, as we get more advanced and more settled in our NGS workflows, and we've got a feel for what we're doing and the kind of tools that we want to use. Uh, in the end of the day, it's going to be more productive to just run it at the command line, learn Unix and type it in, right? And this will allow you to do more uh, custom analysis, more bespoke style of analysis. But for now, we're just going to let Galaxy look after these details for us. Uh, and here you can see it's running Bowtie 2 and it's running Top Hat. And that's the, the mapper underneath that it's, it's running and the versions of the programs that it's running. So all these kind of details can be found by clicking the I button on any of these jobs, right? You'll see these things. So I'm just gonna be uh, patient and let this take off and run. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to have a break and also have a look at uh, how the stream is going and if we have questions over on our um, Piazza forum. Okay. Okay, so no questions, awesome. That makes my life easier. I'm gonna have a cup of tea and pause here. And when I come back, we're gonna see, this will take about 20 minutes. I'm not, I'm not gonna keep the video running for 20 minutes, but what I'll do is I'll show you some um, results that I said running just before, um, before we started recording. Okay, let me go and check that out. Okay, so feel free to pause here, take a break. I'm going to, here I've got uh, results actually that, are, that have worked. So here's Top Hat 2 on these accepted hits. It's got these things, I could click on the, the data, we'll see this format called the SAM or BAM format with a header and here's the alignment data. There's a link on our class website. If we go to class website where it talks in great detail about the SAM or BAM format. BAM is the binary version of the SAM format. So we can see what this is. Generally speaking, you know, we don't really need to look at this yet, right? And actually I rarely do look at it. We read it into uh, genome browsers or other viewers and things like that. We, we, we're not gonna edit this by hand, for example. There are a set of tools called SAM tools, another program that is really good for dealing and manipulating these types of, of files. And we'll often do it through there rather than than editing the file manually or anything like that. So that's all there for you if you're, if you're so motivated to read it. I'm gonna go and uh, look at this uh, data set. So there's a number of uh, result files that are produced here by, by the program that we've just run by Top Hat here. I'm gonna focus in on the accepted hits, right, this one. These are the ones that actually made it, the, 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 the fragments the reads that are mapped to our genome and where they're mapped. So there's a number of options. We can download this file here, right? And you can view it in your own genome browser if you have one like IGV set up on your own computer. There's instructions in the lab hand on handout for, for doing this. I'm actually gonna go and view it over at UCSC. See it says display at main at UCSC, this link that I'm trying to highlight unsuccessfully here, this one. So I've got I'm gonna click on this link. This will open in a new tab and it will display our mapping results on the genome browser, in theory, fingers crossed. Otherwise we'll have to wait for the job to finish. Okay, here it goes. Right, so here I am. At UCSC, you can see the, if you could read the URL up above, it says genome.ucsc.edu. Uh, so we're over at University of California, Santa Cruz, and it's got its genome browser. It looks a little bit more old school than the Ensemble browser, but I actually like it a lot, okay. And I have accidentally loaded my results twice because I was impatient and clicked twice, but that's, that's okay. I'll deal with one. So what we've got here, is again, this is 
the chromosome, right, where I'm focused in on chromosome 17 because that's the last place I looked when I used UCSC before it kind of caches where you were before. You're probably not at uh, chromosome 17. So to make sure that we're not looking at some other region of the genome, you know, there's other lots of lot, lots of other reads mapping to different areas of the genome here. I want to focus in just on the area around those SNPs that we started on, you know, on chromosome 17. So to make sure we're all on the same page, let's go to our hands-on sheet and see the instructions there for a second. So in our hands-on uh, sheet, we'll see that you know it walked us through using FastQC, setting that up. There's some questions there for you to answer that should be pretty straightforward. Section three was setting up the, the job that we just ran and the results. And so here's uh, the link. It's kind of hidden here at uh, the, um, this section here. So this will load the top hat results on the custom track at the UCSC Genome Browser. I'll describe to you what that looks like in a second. But it says, um, enter this region. See, it says chromosome 17, 3800, this thing. These are the coordinates, right? This is where we actually want to go. So I'm going to copy this and paste it, as it says here, into the text box, just to make sure that we're on the same region of the genome, all of us, okay? So this is going to show us the, the genome browser is going to be on chromosome 17 between these two regions. See the dash in between them? I'm going to copy that, and here I'm going to go back then to the, um, the web page. In this case, it's UCSC tab that I have open. And where I'm talking is in this region, in this box right here. Okay, I'm gonna paste in that and I push return and it should move me. Well, it doesn't move me that much, but I mean it should navigate the browser off to that region. So you see the little, you know, a bit like the ensemble one we saw before. You see this red tick here? A red line, so it would be a box if it was a wider region um, or a little rectangle. This is where we're focusing in below here. And I've actually made a mistake because I clicked twice, I've loaded my results. Twice, you see it says accepted hits here. And it's a, and if I put my mouse over it, and if, if we were, if we could zoom in, it would say top hit, top hat, sorry, on data two, accepted hits. That's the job that we ran in Galaxy. That's our results here sent to UCSC to uh, to this region. Uh, also down below here, we can see these different genes, like they're at the bottom, there is ZPB2. Remember this gene that we saw in this region when we were over an ensemble and we read about with that SNP? There's some other genes here. There's their ORMDL3, right, involved in lipid uh, maturation and presentation in airways and things like that. So interesting that these sorts of things are coming up here associated with asthma. And this, this, but this is our results, these things here. I have it in twice, you'll only have it in once if you follow my, you know, if you're better than me. And uh, actually, let's see if I can uh, hide one. Okay, so you'll have this just once. And what this is, is a dense view of where all the reads map. Okay, I, I want to uh, turn this into something a little bit more conventional and easy to understand. So the way I'm going to change this here is you see this little gray sidebar over here. There's probably a specific name that people call this. I just call it the sidebar here. So this little sidebar, if I click on this, it'll allow me to customize how that track is displayed. So I clicked on it and up at the top here, it says display mode uh, dense. That doesn't mean me, right? That means that, anyway, okay. That, I'm going to go full, full on, right? Not dense. It's because it's trying to condense the display of all the information. I'm just going to say full. And then I'm going to say submit. And then it'll go back to the genome browser. And now it's taken that one that was just a tiny little bar, right, that we clicked on that said accepted hits. It's made it, it's showing all the reads here. So if I zoom in, these are the reads. Here's an intron, for example, in this gene. Here's all the reads mapping across that, that region, for example. So let's go and see where they are, right? So here, this is all the reads kind of piled up where they're mapping here. So you can see there's a lot of uh, reads mapping to this, this region, a lot of 
reads map into this region. Let's see what these are. So uh, maybe so there's a lot. Oh, a ton map in here. This is PSMD3. This is ORMDL3. That's those those uh, regions, right? That's those genes that these SNPs affect. So there's a lot of re and this individual. This is you know, this British uh, male that was uh, GG that was homozygous for this asthma SNP. This is their RNA-seq data that we've analyzed, and this is the expression at the time of that experiment for these genes, okay, that we want to determine by counting up all these reads for these genes. Okay, so have a play and an explore and see if you can get a, get a feel for these sort of genome browsers and how they work. It's the same information actually as an ensemble, just a, a different flavor of displaying them. I wanted to show you both of them here in, in today's lab and you can always pick the one that you you like the best to, to go forward with i'm going to go back to our um, galaxy tab and finish off actually you know we've done the hard bit we've done the the mapping now all we have to do is count these up okay so let's go and go back to galaxy here uh, and then we'll do our final oops excuse me our final step which is our counting. So if, if this is all discussed and talked uh, talked through on our PDF. So if we're in our if we're on our PDF session here, it'll show you the same sort of thing, and it'll probably give you some guidelines for the next step. Yeah. So we're going to do. Uh, you could click on NGS RNA analysis cufflinks, or just enter cufflinks. We're going to need this GTF file available from our class website, so you can download that from there. This is the annotation that tells us where the, well, let's load it up and see what this GTF file looks like. And then we'll do this um, cufflinks analysis. Okay. So I'm going to go back to our website here. And we'll find that right here. So let me make sure I have my, keep losing my mouse between the, okay. So I'm going to, actually we need to get that um, GTF file on there. So I need to go back to get data, um, upload file and pick that GTF file. So I'm gonna go choose local file and this genes chromosome 17. So this is, I'm just gonna limit ourselves to chromosome 17 here, although you know, what we've done is, if you think about it, you know, the reason it's taken a long time or that 20 minutes is we've done a lot, right? We've aligned this human RNA-seq data set to the whole human genome, mapped it all back. So it's quite a big calculation we've done. I'm gonna just limit ourselves from counting to chromosome 17 and we'll allow it to do auto detect for this one. It's hard to make a mistake. I'm gonna click start. And once this file is uploaded here, see it's turning yellow, we'll be able to have a, have a look at it. So I'm gonna click on the eye icon for this. So what this GTF file is, it comes from UCSC. That's where I obtained it from, where I downloaded it from. It tells me chromosome 17, there's an exon, right? And it starts at this position and ends at this position. So it's telling me this exon and the gene is ATP2A3. That's the name of that gene and the, the ref seq accession number. We, we would recognize that with the NM, right? We're nerdy enough to recognize that, or if, if, if you're not, uh, good for you. There's ATP, the, the gene name, the conventional gene. So this is talent, this is little landmarks along chromosome 17. If our read lies there, we're gonna count it for that gene, the ATP2A3 at that, at that exon, at that exon. Okay, so let's go on and use this together with the program that we're gonna use for counting. We're gonna use good old cufflinks. Again, um, a somewhat older program in this area. Um, but it works well with top hat, right? There's the top hat, cufflinks, bow tie. You can see the idea, they're called the tuxedo suite or whatever it is. 
So I'm gonna, the input here is correct, top hat on data two. That's great. We're gonna use a reference annotation, say yes. And then it's, it's auto filled in genes, chromosome 17 for me, and we're good to go. So once we have that set, it'll run. And this step should be pretty quick because all we're doing is, you know, counting. It's the easy step computationally. So it's done it, right? It's um, it's actually got the, uh, the, the results already. So cufflinks again, you know, it produces multiple outputs here that you can see on that right hand side. We're gonna just look at the gene expression output here and we're gonna focus in, let's just pick one of the genes that we that we talked about, maybe that ORMDL31. So let's go and see um, gene expression, that's this one. This gene expression one, see it's tabular output. I'm gonna click the little eye icon just to have a look at it here. You can download it. So here's the different uh, gene IDs, short names, all these things. I'm gonna, um, we could look for ORLM D3 in here, I don't know where it is, or look for it. I'm gonna go and look at the, the counts. So here's our, uh, here's our region. This column here is our fragments, FPKM fragments read. Okay, remember we're normalizing uh, here for gene length and the depth of our, of our uh, sequencing, the number of reads mapped totally. And we have some genes here that are really, that are hit, right? So there's these ones, these ones, these ones. Let's go and find out what, um, what, what genes these are. So here's our ORM. DL3. And our FPKM is 1, 2, 8, 1, 8, 9. In this case, if I zoomed in. Sorry, I apologize if that's a bit small. But I'm looking at this column, our FPKM. We can, we can also look at the, the, the counts that we would use for DEC, as we'll see in our next lesson. So here is our FPKM. That's for ORM. DL3. So we've got our expression level for this individual, this British meal, that's GG for this allele, and that's our, that's our, F, sorry, what's that column, the FPKM. So we've, we've done the hard work, okay? So you're very welcome to um, uh, play with Galaxy Server. You'll have access to it for, for a little while. And, and try different mapping methods with this data. You can exp explore those or, or just follow along with our instructions here. What we would do in our next section, obviously, is, is you know, we've got it for one individual. We're interested in, uh, in uh, across population, right? You know, one sample is what we've analyzed. We've analyzed this one meal individual and it's obviously not enough to know what's happening in the population. You know, maybe that British population that's got a high rate of that that allele. Uh, we want to compare that, right? Does this allele make a difference if we analyze multiple individuals with that that genotype or this genotype or that genotype across different populations? And that is section four in our workbook, the optional section four. It's hitting. Um, the, it's coming close to the two hour mark. I know I started just a few minutes late as I was trying to get all these instances up and running. But here, um, section four is optional. I'm going to uh, talk through section four now for folks who are interested. This will be question 13 onward. So what I've done uh, with previous iterations of this class is we've analyzed different individuals and collected that value that we just calculated, right? The, the expression, the normalized expression level for uh, uh, for this SNP and, the, and these uh, genes. So we're going to see now, does having a different, um, having these asthma associated SNPs really affect the expression of that ORMDL3 gene in this case? So let's go back to our, um, back to our worksheet and finish off for today. Okay, so here we are back. So the next 
you know, steps overall in taking the count data would be to do a differential expression analysis. We're going to do that in R next day. That'll be the, the where we take that data and actually analyze it. If we have a drug present or not present or disease condition, not disease condition, these kind of tests we'll, we'll look at next day. But we're going to finish off with a kind of population scale analysis. We're going to go and take this file that's on our class website as well, which has data uh, uh, for individuals from a thousand genome project where I've determined by running uh, the same analysis that we just did on multiple times on multiple individuals. So if you go and click on this file, actually it, it won't paste in, so let's, because it's got this carriage return in it. So we'll go to our class website and download it from there. So here, let me go back to our web page here on our class website. So this is expression genotype results. That's this file here. If I click on this. It actually opens it in my web browser, but it's it's not a CSV file. It probably should have been a CSV file, but it's it's got space separating. It's the sample. If we zoom in, so it's the sample. Uh, that's the code, the thousand genome code, the genotype for that individual, and then that value that we determined the normalized expression values here for those individuals. And there's we've done it quite a few. We'll at the end of today's session, I'll add our individual to this list and we'll have that data too. But let's go and analyze it as it is for now. I'm going to save this file, uh, save as. I'm going to put that into our my project. I'm working on my desktop and courses and then bit one for three and we're in week eight. And I'm going to save that file. And then I'm going to go and finish up for the day and see, answer this question. Does having a GG versus one of the other uh, alleles here really affect the expression of this particular gene? Okay, so I'm going to go back to our studio and read this data in and analyze it. Okay, so back to our studio. Here we are. And we're going to do, this is Section four, population analysis. I'm going to actually copy some of the, the text from the workbook. So this is section four, population scale analysis. I've just pasted in some of the text from my own PDF. Okay, so let's go and analyze this data. Actually, let's, so, We'll find out how many samples we have. So how many samples do we have? Well, we have to read the data first. I'm going to, uh, this is not a CSV file. It was the space that we saw. I'm just going to use read table to read this. So I'm going to call it EXPR maybe. And I'm going to uh, use read table. Now I'm going to give it the name. So it's, um, in this case, it starts with RS. I'll use my tab key to try and autocomplete. I pick this one. Let's do head of it to look at the first few lines, see how we're doing. Let's run that code chunk. And so here I can see that it's read it in properly. I've got a sample, I've got a genotype, I've got an expression value here. That looks looks fine. I could find out the proportion of the different genotypes the same way we did before. You know how many are in each each category. We could do table of this column, right? The genome column. I want to find out how many total there are. How would I do that? Well, I just do. Let me turn this off so you can see the code for both here. I'm just going to do n row of the expr. And I'm going to run that. And so thus far we have uh, 462. It's gone up a little bit uh, since uh, since last quarter we added a couple more. So it's 462 individuals. We have this uh, data for how many of each of each type. Well, we could do the same thing. We could do table 
an expr dollar genotype. That's the column that has the genotype information. So there's 121, 233 of the AG, 108 of the AA here. So we could look at the proportion of that. I actually just want to make a, a figure, a, a summary figure. That's the actual question in the workbook. Is if you were, we were going to, um, if you're going to uh, actually try and communicate these results to someone, right, or write it up in a manuscript, what kind of summary figure could you make? To display uh, these results accurately. So I'm going to try and do that. I'm going to go and let's use ggplot to do this. Library, we could use base graphics to the box plot function, for example. I'm going to use ggplot2. I'm going to load that up here. And um, then I'm going to let's make a box plot with this data. So Or uh, we, we could try density plots or histograms or all sorts of things. Let's try box plot first. So I'm going to do ggplot. That's the main function. I have to tell it the the data frame, the object that actually has my uh, results that I want to plot in it. That's called expression. That's the thing that we read in. So that's expr, right? And I could. Add the aesthetics here, or I can add them in another call. I'll add them in another call. AES. So I'm going to tell it the aesthetics that I want mapped to different aspects of my plot. I want to um, here. I'm going to just go and um, tell it X is going to be genotype. Oh, so that's G A N O. That's the column. So if, if we look at uh, the expression here, so we've got a column called Gino and a column called EXP, it's not extrasensory perception, it's the expression uh, values. So I'm going to use those two columns. So Gino, and we, you know, you can spell out X equals or, you know, often you'll see people not bother Y equals because they're the, the order of the arguments for those things. And then I'm going to, let's add uh, John, we could do John point, John line, John call. I'm going to do John box plot. And try that and see what see what this looks like. Okay, so we have got a boring looking box plot. Okay, so let's try something different. Let's try. Oh, the reason I've got a boring looking box plot is because I'm plotting genotype versus genotype. I said it right with my words and typed it wrong with my fingers because I'm doing too many things at once. I want genotype versus expression. All right, not genotype versus genotype. You see that? I want EXPR here. Or EXP, sorry. That's the column. All right, genotype expression. Let's make sure, look across, there's genotype expression. That's what I want to do. So let's try that again. And ah, looks like a box plot. Okay, so there's um, my different genotypes. There's the AA, the AG, and the GG. So you can see that the GG, the expression is down of this particular gene, this ORM DL3 gene. Um, and we could tidy it, pretty fi this up. Let's do, we could do call equals, let's color it by genotype two, for example. This will the call option here will actually color the extremities, right? The, the kind of stroke, if you will, or the boundary or the border of the boxes. If I wanted to color the, the box itself, I would do fill here. And then I'll have colored boxes. Okay, and it's also added a legend because I'm coloring it by this categorical uh, variable here. A, 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 G, G, G. I could turn the legend off. I'm going to also add, let's also add a um, something you'll see in these box plots that's often helpful is called a notch that we talked about back when we did our graphics class. I'm going to do notch equals true. And this will add a little belt, a little notch in the middle of my box plots. This is often useful visually as a good kind of guide or rule of thumb. You know, if these notches don't overlap, 
they're usually very, very different distributions, right? They're usually going to be statistically significant. We could run a statistical test and, and show it uh, as well, of course. That would be easy to do. We've got all the data in R here. Um, but here we can already see you know, this clearly the GG is, uh, the blue one is very different than uh, than the others here in this in this case, especially the AA here. So it looks like having a GG in this location is definitely associated with having a reduced expression of this gene. Okay, so we've kind of run our course here, and we've done a lot of different things. We've actually analysed. A ton of data. We've repeated this published study in a, in a large sense that we're going to talk about next day. We're going to we've taken we've went and found some variants that are associated with a particular condition that we were interested in or that we were tasked to analyze. This childhood asthma in this case, we found some SNPs that seem to be associated from other people's work, from genome-wide association studies, from Veerlin and colleagues. We went and tracked. Those SNPs down to chromosome 17 to their location. We found genes that are in the vicinity of those SNPs. We focused in on a handful of them, or actually just one of them at the end. Uh, and we did RNA seq analysis of a particular individual to see what the expression level was for that gene or genes in that region. In fact, all genes in, in the person, but we focused our analysis, our attention to just that one. And then we did that. Or, or I've done it for multiple individuals. We run it 240 odd times. The same workflow on different individuals. You know, because we've done it once, we can record it. We can automate it. Just give it a different set of input files. Boom, we've got results here like this that we can analyze and take into R and start making um, inferences about and start forming thoughts about what's going on here about these genes. And then we could dig into the mechanism of how these genes work. How would this be associated? with childhood asthma, for example, these genes that seem to be clearly affected when you have these different SNPs. And then go back to the populations. Is this the same for other populations, et cetera? There's lots of questions that we could go and explore. The cool thing is we didn't touch up a pet, right? We used information that was out there, tons and tons of genomics information. We'll see this if we do our cancer genomics class, if we vote to do that one. There are thousands of data sets out there of whole genome sequences, exome sequences, RNA-seq data like the ones we've analysed, all sorts of cool stuff that we can analyse here now that we have some tools at our disposal to do these, this kind of work. So I realise uh, class time we've probably approached the two hour mark now from when we started, so I'm going to uh, lower schedule for three hours here. I'm going to stop at this mark because it's long enough for any poor soul to listen to me moan on about these things. I'm going to make sure I save my R Markdown document. I'm going to make sure I save my PDF document where I've been entering my answers into the question boxes. And I'm going to make sure of that because I'm going to submit the PDF document uh, to Gradescope so I get the credit for the work for this lab session. So let me save this. I know it's not saved because this thing's blue up here at right? the week eight, the week zero eight up there. If, if you saw it, it's. Um, it's it's um, it's blue, so I'm going to save it. It goes white. I've got my document. I could knit it here, uh, and I encourage you to explore other GG plots. For example, if you want to do gem density, you could see how that looks like. I've got my lab eight uh, session. Let me uh, bring that over so it's knitted. I'm going to show you what that looks like here. So it's opened as a PDF. Here it is. It's got my typos and all, that's got my work, my beautiful plot, and we're ready to uh, ready to proceed and ready to finish off for this lab. So again, we're going to be submitting the other PDF, this one. I'm going to save this thing that has my answers in it, and upload that to Gradescope.